this talk, I think image is a seriously underrated tool for site defense. Um, just a little bit about me. I've been doing systems engineering and security engineering for about 12 years. Um, the last five of it here at Spade War, um, John Bell was on my very first task. Um, so I've gotten a pretty good view of both the commercial side and the DOD side for how security is done. We're here to talk about the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit. You can kind of tell that this is a, one of Microsoft's better utilities by the amount of marketing they put into it. It's an awesome, catchy name. It just goes out there and gets the job done. And uh, I think you guys will see, especially the leadership that's here, you guys will see that this is something that can be used um, very flexibly as needed to protect your endpoints. So, required on 2012 servers now. I understand this. Yep, you stay for 2012. I didn't read that. That's interesting. I'll, I'll come back to that. It's already at the end. There's some other stuff going on there, too. Um, so, just a little background. Um, a lot of you know since the dawn of time, we've been using firewalls to protect our assets, um, our flock, as it were. And for a long time, it worked very well for us. It was the only security strategy we needed. You just put a little flaming brick wall on your Visio diagram and you were good to go. Um, but as the firewalls got more advanced, so did the attacks, and it just became a, a, you know, a war of escalation, until the attacks were so advanced that they were completely evading firewalls and going after the weaker members of the flock. And it's uh, safe to say that it's pretty difficult to protect our flock these days. Um, partly because <laughs> partly because they don't do a good job of protecting themselves. They they like to run wild. They like to do whatever they need to do. They have no control whatsoever, and eventually one of them jumps off a cliff. And. So what have we done to protect this for the past 15 years that we've been dealing with these problems? Um, we started building fences. We needed some way to corral the sheep to keep them inside of their intended boundaries. And the fences are pretty good. Um, data execution prevention, address space layout randomization, secure exception handler overwrite protection, um, these are all very strong mechanisms for controlling the programs and what they're, they're not supposed to be doing. Um, the one thing that's not getting the job done with applications and endpoint protection is that a lot of times these are not used at all or they're not used properly. Um, and one thing came along that you know, in the beginning we didn't really anticipate, and that was pen testers. Um, sometimes they're authorized and sometimes they're not. But sure enough, as soon as as soon as ASLR was invented, ASLR bypass was invented. Same thing for DEP, same thing for Seahawk. It's just the, the natural flow of security and security. So um, the uh, the applications were not being protected by any of the mechanisms that were in place. So Microsoft put out a report, the Security Development Lifecycle Progress Report. It's a big long name. I had never heard of it before I started doing this research, and all my references are at the end as you take notes. Um, so they took data from 2004 to 2010 for 41 consumer applications that covered millions and millions of and they started evaluating them on how they were using the built-in application protections to keep the sheep inside the intended boundaries. And while you can see that TDP is doing okay, we have 71% usage rate, ASLR is pretty dismal, 34.1%. I, <laughs> I think as security professionals, we could probably agree that partially enabled ASLR might as well not be enabled at all. Is that just a compiler bug? Well, it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I didn't I didn't know what it took to to enable these things. So I went out and did more research, and I found out that yes, it is just a compiler bug. 
You pull up your application configuration page in Visual Studio, and right at the top, randomize base address and two spaces down, data execution prevention. You turn those flags on, you recompile the application, and do a little testing. I'm sure that's a little bit of an oversimplification, but, but you get the idea. Um, it's not getting done. And it's probably not going to get done. Um, a, lot of, a lot of blame gets thrown to the programmer, saying if the, program, if the programs were only secure the code from the start, that we wouldn't be having these problems now. But the simple fact is nobody is beating on the programmer's desk, saying if you don't put that security feature in, you're not getting your bonus. And the company's you know, not staying in business. So we, as security professionals, some security programmers had to think of better ways to manage flock, to manage what the applications are doing. So what is better than a fence is a sheepdog. It's something that can think on its own and go out and actively seek out inappropriate behavior or unprohibited behavior and curtail that before something bad happens. And keep the sheep off the cliff, right? Keep the sheep away from the wolves. Um, so enter Microsoft MF, the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit. I can't say that fast. So <laughs> what is it? It's a free utility from Microsoft that's based on the .NET 4.0 platform. Um, it's very simple, very small. It is not a blacklist, so there's no signatures, no updating, um, no you know, Bayesian heuristics. It does not block anything. It's not a whitelist. You don't have to go through and um, test for every, every application in your organization that you could ever possibly use in hopes of not getting help test calls. It does not block anything. Um, there's no guessing, it's just good programming on the part of the, the people who made it, Microsoft engineers, there's you know, special security divisions at Microsoft that work on this stuff. So um, you might say, you know, what about the what about the host base IDS stuff? For example, in HPSS, maybe you just really love HPSS and you want to use that instead. Um, and the problem is it goes right back to the fact that most of what they're doing is blacklisting. You're constantly updating, constantly getting new versions. Your signatures are wrong. You know, somebody from McAfee makes a mistake in the signatures and it blocks everything on your network. Um, it's very complex. If you've ever installed HPSS, if you've ever upgraded HPSS, it's ridiculously complex. They cannot be efficient and simple. It's just too much. So. Speaking of the installation, we'll go through a, a typical Microsoft installation. It's, you've seen this a thousand times. You just run the installer, and you click next, <laughs> next, 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 I agree. Next, 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 next. And then you have to make a decision. <laughs> One decision. For the purposes of learning, you know, I recommend that you just use the recommended settings. Everything is very flexible, so you don't, you're not locked into any settings. From the very first interface, you'll see where um, you can easily go in, and I have a pointer here. There are custom security profiles. So as soon as you finish the install, if you don't like what's set, you can go right back in and back it all out and start over. Or you can run through a configuration wizard where they'll ask you some pretty simple questions and get basic stuff up and running. But it's really simple, sane defaults. Um, the, uh, the bottom half of the window here is your tab manager. Those are all your running processes. And it's the same that servers or workstations are both. Both. Yep. So it's all your running processes. And you can see that I have not enabled them on any of my applications on this machine. So the, the top half there are the, the general system protection settings. So this is no different than going through your GPOs, or going through your registry, or you know, scripting it to set these things system-wide. The EP, C Hop, ASLR, those are going to enforce the settings that may not already be being enforced, and it doesn't cover the applications that don't want to use it. So if the application is poorly coded, if the programmers don't care about security, 
Um, it's not going to it's not going to help you there. That's where you go back to if I back up to the to the main GUI. Um, a little button here that says apps, or you can you can right click on this and configure it that way. But that brings you to the application configuration settings, and this is where it really starts to get good. So you open one application, such as iExplorer, Internet Explorer, and these are all the protections that Emmet enforces on that application. And we'll look, I'll explain a little bit about most of those later. Um, but once you once you enable the three check boxes up there, um, deep hooks, and ID tours and man functions, that application is being protected for everything that Emmet can do. So if you're not using one of the the predefined applications that they've done a lot of testing on, you're obviously going to have to do some testing in your own environment, right? There's just things that you don't want to don't want to kill, for lack of a better word. But once you do that, your applications are protected. So you you do that for your Java, your Acrobat, your iExplorer, Firefox, Chrome. You know some of these things that don't provide their own built-in protection mechanisms. So you're protected. Um, happy cheap, right? <laughs> but we like to know how it works. We built careers on knowing how everything works. So I, I started looking into it. And the way that the reason why I say it's just programming, it's just good programming practices, is because there's there's no tricks to do this. These are built-in things in the Windows operating system. Anytime that your application makes a call to a, a part of Windows or a driver or anything like that, it has to go through the import address table to find out where these pieces are in memory so that they can call them or where, what DLLs they are. And these mechanism, mechanisms called shims exist just for this occasion. The Emmet software inserts a shim into every application that you enable the protections for. And it rewrites the addresses for the built-in Windows system calls and the, the dangerous you know, parts of memory that, may, uh, that are typical to attack. So, long story short, there is no getting to the Windows system without going through the end machine. Um, there's just no way around it. It's built in system calls. At least as far as I know. Maybe someday there will be, but, but not right now. This works for both static and dynamically linked DLLs. So, you don't have to worry about people injecting code into running applications to load dynamic DLLs and getting around Emmet's protection. Just, it just works. Um, I think that's an app. <laughs> so, um, which actually brings us, you know, from the shim down to the next slide to where all the good stuff is. These are all of the protections that Emma provides for running applications. And now here's the key. A lot of the big consumer applications already use a lot of these protections, but the problem is they don't use them simultaneously. If you have ASLR or DEP running without being in tandem, they're useless. Um, every bypass or every protection has a bypass mechanism that relies on these other protections not being in place. So by enforcing all of these protections to run simultaneously, you eliminate the return-oriented programming, you eliminate the, the heap spraying and stack spraying, um, and that's where the, that's where the protection really is is jaws. So, um, and to be honest, I don't know what a lot of these are. I have no idea what the bottom up is. <laughs> um, so, is is C hop a memory based attack? Sort of. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering how so, the import table shim helps. Okay. okay. So I'll I'll run through some of these. Some of the big ones for anybody who might not know. Um, Data execution prevention is, has been going in Windows since Windows XP. And what that means is when you have when you have resident data in memory that is not executable, such as an integer or a string or anything else, it cannot be treated as an executable file. So you cannot take the string, um, you know, whatever assembly language string you manage to cram into a buffer and execute it as an executable. So that is very good protection for that, but without ASLR, it's very easy to bypass. ASLR is the, the randomization of addresses in memory. 
So the programs that run, including the Windows built-in functions, never get put in the same place twice. And those two together, but, but without EEP, ASLR is, is pointless. So those two together are very good protections. CHOP is, I read that it was about 20% of the exploits in Metasploit used CHOP, or used SEHO, Structure, Exception, Handling, Overwrite. So anytime something bad happens in the program, it creates an exception. Programmers create exception handlers. So Structure, Exception, Handling, Overwrite takes the built-in structured exception handling mechanisms in Windows and says, I'm going to forcefully crash this program, and at the last second, I'm not going to let it do its normal exception structure. I'm going to point it to a new function where I injected the, the pointer into memory. It's a buffer overflow. It's very similar to a buffer overflow, okay. but, it, but it uses the exception handling mechanism on a forced crash. Gotcha. Yeah, so, yeah. But that's how the shim prevents that, right? Is that right. I got you. So, right. right. so, so they do the thing to make the call for yeah. that new stack. It, it ran exactly. Out. The P on the end is the protection. Yeah. So, and again, that's a built-in function of the window, the built-in mechanism of the windows, but it's just not enforced very often. So, um, I only know about what half of the application protections do. Um, Mill pages is another memory attack. Um, heap spray is a, all of them are very similar. Um, the ones that I know. Anyway. And you see up here that you know it doesn't cover XP 2003, which is good because nobody uses those anymore. <laughs> um, so very simple. That's the end of uh, the end of the presentation on application protection. But it does have one other very important feature that is new in version 4.0, um, and that is certificate pinning. Um, so give me what? Certificate pinning. Pinning, thanks. Pinning. So if you pay attention to security news, you know, there's a lot of talking heads that are talking about how PKI is going to be dead in five years, and that would be a very bad thing. Yeah, or very good, depending on your perspective. Um, so it's, it's not being used in the way it was intended, right? It's very, it's very overworked. It's very tired. Um, and it's just, you know, there's no reason that my Spaywar endpoint should trust a certificate from Kenya. Um, you know, we are starting to see more, I think in the past year, there have been four or five large-scale exploits, or large-scale attacks on, on root CAs. So they're putting out fraudulent CAs, you know, or maybe somebody who works there just wanted to make some extra cash, who knows. But anyway, it's bad. So what? What Emmet does is it allows you to pin a website or a server to a specific certificate or a specific CA. So when your user loads up um, spayor.nady.mil, if, if that user had been redirected to an invalid root CA, then Emmet blocks it and throws up a warning. So this is not as important in the DoD because we have our own root CAs. But when you put a lot of endpoints out there going to Facebook or Twitter or who knows, but how many people actually go through and prune the list of certificates? Right, that's the key. So most people don't remove the, the trusted root CAs. That's something that you have to take into account if you want to use this feature. You prune the list of trusted roots and you, for the if websites that are important to you, or the websites that have a long history of being attacked, Facebook, um, you pin them to the CAs that you like. And you know, it's not going to protect you from every bad root CA, you know, but it is another mechanism of providing protection in a commonly attacked scenario, commonly a weak point. Um, until we come up with something better than the current PKI structure, all this little stuff will hopefully add up and you know, offer us some protection. So, any you know other questions on that? So you're saying that you can kind of explain the process of how we can pin yep. something to the user? Sure. Sure. There is the trust button up at the very top. Um, I didn't put any slides for the, the actual working parts of it, but it's not a complex process. 
you, you choose, you know the website that you want to pin. If you, if you choose Facebook.com, then you put Facebook.com in there and you look at Facebook certificate that you went and downloaded from the legitimate site and you select the CA that you approve to be your certificate pin. So um, that's it. <laughs> there really is no more to it than that. Then you enable it, right? Yep. You, you enable it once you get in there and you say that this, this website will only be authorized to use this CA. And you can use root CAs or intermediate CAs. And um, it may actually be a good thing in the DOD because you know we have a fair amount of root and intermediate CAs. Right. Or if you prefer, do it to your own OCS users locker. You know, put the certs on there. Nice. If you want your if you want your users to use that, and I know that's something we do on my on my task. Um, speeds everything up. You know, you know they're not going out over the interwebs. Yeah, so it prevents basically uh, uh, one of the trusted routes that are on the, the big fat list that you get with your operating system, right, from being compromised and some hacker generating certificates for every website that they want to compromise would be the man middle for, right, and faking you out, right. At least you know that hey, that's that's not supposed to be the root CA for Facebook. Yeah, they must have changed it or hacked. Yep. Gotcha. That's cool. Mm -hmm. It seems so simple. It is. That's why I like my hands on that part. That's why I think that's one of the reasons why this utility is so flexible because it's not complex. They didn't make it this massive cluster of things where you know it takes a PhD to to update. So if you're a private company, for example, Basically, your sites and your your partners, your financial institutions that you deal with, what's those in it? Right. The rest of the world, you know, have enjoy. It, it it depends on uh, how flexible and you know open you want to be. Maybe you maybe you allow your users to go to, to Bank of America and Facebook, but you know that those sites are going to have their own certificates from proper, you know, probably VeriSign or CAs, right? And just like John said, you you limit it to the VeriSign or CA and it uh, blocks off the bad guys. You know, a lot of the a lot of the Java exploits now are coming with built-in signed certificates. So you know the Java the jar that you're getting is a signed jar from somebody from somebody. You know, and it, it, what turned out was that Java was Allowing code with any certificate, as long as it had any kind of certificate attached to it for, for a signing cert, um, it was executed outside of the sandbox. So, yeah. as long as you self sign, yeah. as, as long as you self sign, <laughs> sign <laughs> you know, leap from hacker.com, you know, is outside the sandbox. You know, full admin permissions. Um, so, it could be pretty handy. You know, I, I will be honest, I have not employed a ton in production. You know, it's just something I kind of play around with. But I think it's with PKI potentially failing, so we need to start looking at mitigations and protections. So, um, the bad news, um, you know, there's not much bad news. Um, you know, I would say that it's not perfect. You know, all of the protections in there are going to eventually have bypasses, but I think the, the programming side of this will continue to flow and evolve as the attacks evolve. And the really bad news is that sometimes programmers are just really, really bad. Some applications are coded so poorly that they rely on not having ASLR or DEP or whatever. So when you enable Emmet on your line of business app that was done by your custom, your custom developers, it blows up and the server burns to the ground. Just going to have to deal with that on a case by case basis. You know, there's a lot of stuff that they can test on, but there's much, much, much more that they can use. So if you find that testing, you just don't enable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All that. yeah. So yeah, or the specific piece of the bracing, right? No. <clears throat> you can still use Emmet, but you might not. You might right. not be able to use ASLR. You might not be able to use DEP. Right. Exactly. So, so what are the indicators you can get of why it blew up? I've seen stuff that just crashes, right? I mean, that, it's pretty, pretty so, you know, painfully, yeah, pretty painfully obvious when um, when the program just 
just die and crashes and stuff starts blowing up. Um, I have not seen any subtleties of failures yet. Um, I haven't done as much testing in, say, Microsoft Lab as, but you know, I've played around doing research for this and just using it at home and stuff like that. I haven't had any major problems. The, the real problems that I've had is when, um, especially working on the demos for this presentation, running in it and attacking it and then seeing what happens. Because sometimes it's pretty, sometimes it's not. Um, I guess I would rather see it be not pretty and not get popped. Yeah, so there, I, mean, I really don't think there's too much bad news on this one. It's small, and if it doesn't work on one system, don't use it. It's a, uh, it is very small. It's like a four or five meg executable for the whole thing. So your your deployment enterprise wide is whatever you're currently using. You don't have you don't need you know kind of server architecture. Um, you just roll it out with GPOs or packages, whatever you like. It's um, management. It's got its own built-in GPO interface, so you can set up your enterprise GPOs. It has a command line, so you can script it through PS exec or whatever you please. And it's but it's GPO configurable, so I can go to my PC yep. and set a GPO and it'll apply all the MNFs to the domain. I can't I can't think of the uh, the GPO extension by that's all yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you just double click on the little next to and it puts the proper GPO. Cool. Just like you're doing with Office 2010 and stuff like that. Um, and so here I here's where I was coming back to the Service 2012 thing. Um, Jonathan Ness is one of the heads of security, you know, high security architecture, something like that for Microsoft. And he's one of the first guys that I was here to talk about it. What he said is that it's most of the protections that they're learning, the feedback that they're getting from the, the M application are getting baked into the new platforms. So Windows 8 and Server 2012 already have most of this stuff built in. And so if DISA is, is making them mandatory, um, I'm not sure where the overlap will be as far as what, what is protected by default and what is protected by M. That's the first I've heard of it, I'll probably check it out. So what, what you're saying, if I'm understanding what you're saying is that most of MS features are going to be intrinsic to the newer OSs. I don't, I have no way of qualifying or quantifying what most is. Um, they said that they are taking features from it and okay. making them into the OS. I have no idea how many or which ones. Which sounds like it'd be more important to put it on the older operating systems than the new ones, right? For right. the right. stage yeah. and all that, right? Yeah, better to remain on the old stuff. Old stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I mean, that's it. It's a super simple application. You know, I I went from from nothing to feeling like I was confident with it in a matter of hours. You know, on my home systems, and I I think it's really really underrated. I think people need to start using it, whether you have you know. Five people doing HR somewhere in a small company, or would you have know, thousands across Bay One? On your home systems, did you notice any significant application breakage? I have not. Um, my my Windows stuff at home, I don't do as much work as I do on my my Mac. Um, so it was really more for um, you know people using Firefox or Chrome. Web browsing, Outlook, right. and I didn't see any problems with any of those. You know, I really just run mainline applications on my stuff now, via my workstation. Okay, so, okay. Did you try to throw some hacks at it and see if it protected you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep, I'll come back to that. Oh, yep. So I guess question said when it fails, it can fail spectacularly, but mm -hmm. um, what kind of community buzz is there around it for sort of maybe the unspectacular but hidden failures that aren't so obvious? You think you got a good solution, you put it out there, and then you got like 10% of your users saying, I can't do stuff. So they do they do have a specific end forum off of TechNet. Um, I guess with TechNet, I'm not sure if the TechNet forums are going away or just the subscription. Um, so yeah, so they do have they do have a forum out there and it is semi-active. You know, as I was looking through there, I saw people uh, actually from Microsoft responding to problems. Um, I don't think there's 
as much of a community around it as there should be, just because I, I think it's under uh, market. So, well, it makes you wonder how the supportive tool is going to be, right? Is yeah. this, this just kind of a test thing they're trying yeah. out, or is this something they're really claiming they're going to support long term? It'll be interesting if, this, uh, if they are saying that it's mandatory too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, hopefully the transition will be that they just <clears throat> build all of those things directly in, right. right, and enforce them, and then you would have to sort of go in and, and manually bypass those restrictions for a specific process that was written so poorly it couldn't handle, right? <clears throat> so that by default they're on, you have to work to turn them off. Yeah, you know, I mean, and here, our so, environment, we typically have a little, <laughs> bit, uh, a little bit easier time getting Microsoft support, right, because we have 4 billion licenses, so. I see that as being less of an issue here as I would you know, in a little small shop that has five and just seven desktops. What about performance? Did you try to track any of that and see if there was? I didn't track anything um, you know, through actual performance tracking software. I didn't do any of that. I just go based on my perception. Um, I did not notice any um, performance problems running running multiple VMs. Um, running multiple VMs, you know, throwing attacks at it, and you know, just really trying to, to hurt it for this presentation. Can you just, can you configure it off to alert so that you even yes. know? Yep. So it has it has the, the tray alerts where you get the little little pop up window that fades away there. It alerts to the event log. And I think, it, no, it didn't do syslog, that was something like that. So event log and trade. So any time it, it detects a violation that, I mean, I guess what is it alerting you to, I guess is my question. Because I mean, a lot, of those, a lot of those preventions are not reactive, but are instead proactive. So it's not like you're. So it would say Emmett. It says like Emmett like, blocked a such and such. You know Emmett blocked. Um, so for DEP that makes sense, right? But I guess for like ASLR, I don't even know what it would tell you. It's like, hey, uh, somebody asked for something that wasn't there, but because I moved it. You know, because you're not going to know, right? You're just going to your your exploit's going to fail, right? Because you're going to try to address an assembly instruction that's not in the register that you thought it was in, and so you're just going to. Well, I guess you would throw an exception, right? A system wide right. exception. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, honestly, I don't know what. Man, I don't know. I'm trying to see. This VM probably is. Uh, I did a lot of snapshots with these, so it probably did not have much in the VM model.
might be in uh, targeting. And so the interpreter is has got a HTTP um, a website essentially going with a bad PDF that is serving up. Um, so I, I read your form, we just not blow up. Well, oh no, so that that's really a good question. So yeah, is that the application is basically erroring out and bombing and freezing versus allowing the exploit to occur. Right. Is what you're saying. Ah, um, right. right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, I guess it. Hopefully I'll be able to show this without well, everything on the first thing that lands. Yeah. So you have a PDF with client side exploit trying to do a buffer overflow style attack here. Yeah, yeah. What would like the update reader or the updater attack? No, it's um cool type. Yeah, okay. okay. Yep. So I have two VMs here. One's a target and one has the MF running on it. And pretty simple. I tried I tried to do this um, in a way that was not some crazy setup attack, right? Like these are normal circumstances. Both these machines have every Windows patch available. They have the latest version of Java, they just have an older version of Acro Path that hasn't been updated. Um, so you know, someone, however they get a PDF, I chose to go web for this because it was easy, but a lot of times it's obviously done through email or what have you. Um, Spear phishing victim A clicks and convicted. So the application actually blows up, but in different ways a couple of times. Right? This is not a real PDF. This is something that was created at random inside of Metsploit just for these purposes. Um, So, <laughs> it's sending crafty PDF. Sometimes it actually does take a long time. System, the one without ever running. What typically happens when I'm not in the middle of the presentation is that the it downloads the PDF and it loads it in Acrobat and says, you know, this document is corrupt. You know, please try again. And it can't do anything with it because it's just a it's just a randomly jump generated PDF. But in the in the interpreter session. Um, Here's one that I was doing earlier. So you see the same thing right there, it's sending craft PDF, and it opens up a reverse TCP shell right to this session. So it migrates the process into something, yeah, right there, notepad. So if you have notepad.exe running on the target system when you never opened it, and it's not something that you would normally think to investigate, right? You just see notepad, you're like, oh, whatever. Um, but the process is actually a interpreter shell. So you can see that um, I type the wrong session ID, and I got the right session ID. And I'm on the Kali Linux machine, but I'm running IP config on the Windows machine. So <coughs> The server is dot ten, but the host that I'm talking to is dot one point nine. Um, I'm kind of messing around there. I see into the C windows or just C, um, but it's, it's full administrator privilege shell access right there. And the only the only discernible difference on the target machine was that you had a weird PDF pop up, which we have not right now. Um, you had a weird PDF pop up and. And you have in your process you list. Notepad in your process list. If you didn't know, if you weren't an InfoSec pro that knew that PDF not functioning right was an indicator of compromise, nobody would look at that. You know, the, the typical thing is they throw these PDFs on a thumb drive or a CD. You know, leave them around the, the business somewhere with a, a file name like layoffs.pdf. <laughs> 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 
nobody is not going to open that. You know, maybe we wouldn't. I probably would, but um, I'd be in a sandbox. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of, course. of course. So you know, so it, it's open. Um, you know, and and you have a shell right there. Well, I can access. Now, what happens on the other VM is it just blows up. Maybe I think that would work. We're still listening. We'll try it on this one to see if it blows up for us. So, this one actually has that one running. Did you restart your VM since the last time you hacked it with that same exploit on the one that doesn't have MN? Probably not. Yeah, that's what it is. It's your memory space. So, I see. I hope it just blows up. It just doesn't want to do it. It's trying to access, um, you know, I think this one is an actual ASLR style return for you to program you could hack. So, it's trying to access memory space that it's not allowed to get to, and Windows is just not letting you. So, that's it. Yeah, or, or, or in that case, right, it's probably that it's going to the statically decoded address space that's looking for like a junk EAX instruction inside of the DLL, but that DLL is not loaded there, and so it yeah. runs some bogus assembly instruction and throws that exception. Right, that's, that's a much better answer. <laughs> 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 <Holy open. laughs> Rather than some program styles, which would mean it's not man. Yeah, I was going to yeah. Oh, the exploit? 
Um, so no is the answer, right? Because the, the running process is the privileges that apply, and it's right. going to always have access to system DLLs, which is how that works, right? So unless you, you know, move those DLLs in place where you don't know how to get to them. Yeah. So you know, so what probably would happen in the real world is if you're running as a very restricted user, non-admin, lots of stuff locked down, Acrobat would still get popped, and it would give you a shell based on whatever permissions you have. Um, sometimes you can get, you know, admin, depends on what vulnerability you're using. Um, I don't remember for this one what it does, but even if you get just regular user permissions, there are tons and tons of permission escalation. Escalation yeah, yep, absolutely. So, yeah, a lot of the attached. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Those are really you know, and you talk to any of the guys who are professional pen testers, they don't need admin rights right away. They yeah. need a user. You can, you can, can't you dump the, the LSAS? For the not with new versions, with old versions, you could. You can use the registry LSAS method to do it with non pillars accounts, but I think that's only before like 2003 and earlier. But yeah, I would love to do a talk on Cali sometime in the future. That would be a really cool. They go talk about it. Yeah. We talked just about that as a play for way too long. So, what's the big shift from backup to Cali? Um, it's a new platform. They moved over to Debian. They repackaged all the tools with Debian compliant packages. And they have a lot of really great ARMS images now that are, that are fully supported. So, you can get it for like Galaxy Tab or um, Samsung Chromebooks. Uh, Raspberry Pi, right? Oh, those are all supported Cali on. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm going to bring my Cali on Pi next week, baby. <laughs> Once I get my wireless card with the right chips, that's like a Wi Fi track. <laughs> man, that's a hard thing to find these days. All the new USB chipsets are all. They don't have to do any of those hacky things anymore, like, you know, do segmentation attacks or all those other things you used to be able to do. I have, I have one of those ones, uh, the NBH something. One with the, the uh, it's like a two watt antenna, the big eighteen inch antenna. Oh yeah, yeah. It's got, support got a good good chipset, like a real tag or a yeah. And support that. the old stuff, like the old air cap. Yeah, so like in order to get like AirCrack and G or any of those new tools to work, right? You actually need to have an older wireless chipset yeah. to get you those things. Most use mode a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. but. So, so that's all that I have. Um, any other questions or you mentioned the word records earlier. Yes. I will I can put the slides out. Um, or you can just I don't think you want to write down these URLs. No. Can you put them on the website? Yeah, I can put the slides on the website. Um, cool. If anybody wants to see the uh, the unrated version of this talk, I'm speaking at besides Augusta next month. So the unrated version is exactly the same. <laughs> 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 <laughs>